He became a curse so that we might be redeemed. He is the one who died that we might live forever. The Word of God is constantly about the substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross that He died for us. Well, wait a minute. It's not just in the Bible. We sing all about it. We sing about it. I don't know anything about this message today, but if you have your little uh, order of service, I want to show you how we sing about it. These are some that he just picked out. You don't know anything I'm preaching about today. Look down there at the very bottom of the first page. My faith has found a resting place. Listen to what these words say. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor decree or creed. I trust the ever-living one. Here it is. His wounds for me shall plead. Go on. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and what? And that he died for me. That's not all. Look over here. On it is well with my soul. This verse he has. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Why? Who was nailed to the cross? Jesus, my sin was nailed to the cross. Get your hymn book out and look at it. The old rugged cross. It's all about the fact that Jesus died. It is well we talked about that. What a friend we have in Jesus at the cross. All of those have in it verses and most of them multiple verses that talk about Jesus took my place. Jesus was my substitute. When he died, he died for me. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, that great preacher of Great Britain, writes these words about the substitutionary death of Jesus. Substitution is the very marrow of the whole Bible, the soul of salvation, the essence of the gospel. We ought to saturate all of our sermons with it, for it is the lifeblood of the gospel ministry. What? The substitutionary death of Christ is the marrow of the bones of the gospel, and it runs throughout all of the scripture. Jesus Christ was and is our substitute. He died for us, his friends. I want you to know and to focus on the fact that Jesus died for us. Now, what does it mean that Jesus was our substitute? What are the requirements to be a substitute? Specifically, what are the requirements for Jesus to be our substitute as our Redeemer and as our Savior? What are the requirements? Dr. Ronald Lee, as he spoke about substitutionary death and wrote an article about substitutionary death, he, he gave three characteristics that are necessary and required for substitution to take place. And those three things I want to share with you and talk to you today about those three requirements for any substitution to take place. And I want to make you think. I want you to look out there and really think with me. Can you think? This means yes. Okay, can you think this morning? All right, it's a good thing to think. So we want to try that this morning, all right? So stick with me in regard to this aspect of substitution. Well, the first requirement, in order to be qualified as a substitute, there has to be similarity. You need to write that down. There's got to be similarity in order to be required or to be able to meet the requirement of being a substitute. Now, how many of you know what this is? A light bulb. Thank you, Terry. You're thinking. You beat everybody else to that. All right. This is a light bulb. How many of you ever replaced a light bulb? All right. And we have to replace light bulbs sometimes when those light bulbs blow. When the filament is broken inside of them, they no longer are able to give light. So let's just say at your house that you have a blown light bulb and you want light in that room or that closet, so you're going to have to find a substitute for that light bulb. Now what are you going to use as the substitute for that light bulb? Well, the requirement is there has to have similarity. In other words, 
If you were going to go and make your light shine again, are you going to go stick your book or your Bible in that light bulb, in that hole? Are you going you to stick your Bible in there? Is your Bible going to glow if you stick it in there? Is it going to make going to shine? No, it's, it's not going to do that. What about a flower? Could you stick a flower in there and, and you'd have light in your room? I'm going to check the choir out. If y'all stuck a flower in there, would, would, would that work in, in your light bulb? No. No, that won't work. You know why? Because this light bulb is glass. It's made of glass. And it also had threads on, on the end of it. You see those threads? So it's got to have something. It's got to be glass and it's got to have threads on it. I know what we could do. We could use a ketchup bottle. Ketchup bottle will work, isn't it? I mean, ketchup bottle has got glass. It's made of glass, and it's got threads on the end of it. So go home today, and you plug in your ketchup bottle and see if it works. Is it going to work? No, it's not going to work. Because the only way that something can be a substitute is it has to be similar. It has to have similarities. You have to find the right one that goes into that socket that fills that whole. If, if it doesn't have similarity, it's never going to work. It's got to have that similarity. Well, it also, let's talk about this. Have any of you ever had a, you ever had a, a, a flat tire? You had a flat tire in your car? Let me see those hands. All right, a few people have had flat tires. Now, if you came out and your tire was flat in your car, what would you do? Well, would you get a, a chair and say, I'm going to just let my car sit in this chair a while until it recovers? Would you put it in a chair? Well, what about put a blanket over the tires? You just put a blanket, let it warm itself up for a little bit. When it gets warmed and nurtured back to health, you think it'll, you think it'll make it? You think your tire will work? If you all go out there and put blankets on your tires, I'm telling you, I'm not claiming who you are, all right? What about a crutch? If I can't walk and I can't get along, I, I get a crutch. And I, what about putting a crutch in your car, on your tire? You think that would work? Think it would be? Okay, y'all not sure. Y'all not committing yourself to anything up there in the choir. Too much? Oh, of course that wouldn't work. You're smart enough to know that you wouldn't give it a blanket, a chair, or a crutch. What you need is what? Another tire. You need another tire, a tire that is, that is like or similar to the one that you have on your car. It has to have similarities in order for it to work. Well, let's move it into the human realm. Let's say that there's a fourth grade teacher and the fourth grade teacher gets sick. And the fourth grade teacher needs a substitute. Now, whenever she gets a substitute, you think they would call a panda bear. How I many would call the panda bear to be the substitute? What about a parrot? A parrot can talk. Okay, so we get a parrot in there to handle it. Now, most, sub, most teachers say, I don't care what you get. Just get them. I'm sick. All right. You, you, you just leave it with them. I don't care. But, but that wouldn't be what we would do. What would we do? We would go out and find another person who was either a qualified teacher who had been trained to do that and who had hopefully the knowledge of that subject that they're going to be a substitute, we would get somebody who is similar in relationship to that person that we're replacing so that that substitute could happen. See, you have to have similarity in order to meet the requirement to be a substitute. It has to be similar to the original. But hold on a second. It's going to be very similar to the original, but it's not going to be exact. Because the second thing that you've got to have as a requirement to be a substitute, there's got to be a difference. There's got to be a difference. It's similarity, but there's got to be a difference. In other words, you don't want it just like the original. If you've got it just like the original, it's not going to help you. What do I mean by that? Well, okay, back to the light bulb. If you were to take a light bulb and this filament's broken and it, it's not shining, if you go into your closet or come out and you get, and I've had this happen before, and you go in and you screw it into the socket and turn it, and it still doesn't turn on. You know why it doesn't work? Because somebody put the old bulb back into the packet, and it was already burnt out. So if you take a burnout bulb and replace the burnout bulb with a burnout bulb, how much light are you going to get? You're not going to get any. So we don't need it to be exactly the same because it's not going to help us. We need to be there some distinct difference between the original. Same way with that flat tire. Do you want to replace your flat tire with another flat tire? It's not going to help you any. I've had that experience happen. Have you ever had that happen? You know those little donuts they put in the back of your car? Well, I'm going to give you all some from free advice. 
If you haven't put it on the ground recently, check the air in it. Because we had an experience coming. It's always going to happen about midnight, you know, when you're traveling on the road. We had an experience, Lynn and I did, coming home and, and had a tire that the, the tread began to come off the tires. I had no problem. Pull over. Put the donut on. The only problem is the donut didn't have any air in it. I hadn't checked it. So it only ran for a few miles, ran off there, and then I ended up having to put the one that didn't have very good tread and limp home is what we did. I'm here to tell you, putting one flat tire on, one punctured tire on to replace the other doesn't do you a bit of good. There needs to be a distinct difference between the tires. One doesn't hold air and the other does hold air. There's got to be that distinct difference. Just like with that substitute teacher. What good would it be if you called a substitute who was sick too? And she's sick, going to replace the one who is already sick. What good's that going to do? The sick one can't replace the other. We need them to be different. Close, similar, but a distinct difference between them. A distinct difference between them. Now, if you get those two things, similar to the original, but a distinct difference... Now you've got the potential for substitution to take place. You've got, notice what I said, the potential for substitution to take place. But it hasn't taken place because there's a third thing that's got to happen. And the third thing has got to happen is there's got to be an exchange. All right? There's got to be an exchange for substitution to take place. For instance, if I've got a bulb that's blown out and it's there in my light socket... But inside the closet, I have a whole box of brand new light bulbs. Those brand new light bulbs inside that closet are not going to help me one bit until they come out of the packet, the old one taken out, the new one put in, and now it shines. An exchange had to happen. You got it? Same way with a tire. A flat tire, if you have a good tire in your trunk, it's not going to help you a bit unless you have the ability to get the tire out and to connect it to the hub of the wheel, and therefore it will work. There has to be an exchange that takes place. Same way with the substitute teacher. You have that substitute teacher, she's similar, she's in good health, she's able to do it, but she doesn't show up. If she doesn't show up to school, it doesn't matter how good a help she is and how well she was qualified to substitute. If the exchange doesn't happen, a substitution hasn't taken place. You get the picture? Three things, similarity, a distinct difference, and exchange. Those three things have to be in order in order for substitution to take place. You say, Brother Mac, that's good and wonderful. Well, what has that got to do with us? It's got everything to do with you and, more importantly, everything to do with Jesus. (laughs) Because he meets those requirements to be your substitution. What I mean, well, he is similar to us. That is why he left heaven to come to earth to take on the form of man. He was made like us in the image of man. God, as I told you last week, God in heaven cannot die. And God had to become man in order to experience death. And Jesus became God incarnate. He took on the form of man in order that he might be able to take our place, that he might be a substitute for us. He was similar to us as a man, he could die. As a man, he could pay the price. And the price, remember, the price of sin is death. Death. And and he would die and he could die because He was a man. He was the God-man, but he could die and he did die because he was similar to us and he was able to die. But hold on a second. He was similar to us, but hold on. There was something that was distinctly different about him. Something distinctly different about him. For see... All of us were born in sin. We were of the seed of Adam. Every one of us, when we came into this world, we were sinners. That old sin nature was a part of us. We didn't have to learn it. We didn't have to buy it. We didn't have to get it somewhere. It was ours. We were sinners. 
And because we were sinners, we committed sin. And because we committed sin, we deserved to die. And because we were sinners, there was no way we could pay for our sin and somebody else's sin. The only sin we could pay for was ours. And we deserved to pay for it. Well, my friend, if Jesus had come and he was born of Adam and he was a sinner and he had committed sin in his life, he would be just like us and he wouldn't have been able to die for our sin either. But he wasn't like us. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He was born of the Holy Seed. He never committed sin. He never thought sin. He never did sin. He was perfect, absolutely perfect, without blemish in his life. Distinctly different from us, like us, but distinctly different from us. And because he had no sin, he was able to come and to take our place and to pay the price for our sin and to be our substitute. He was able to do that. He was qualified to do that. But here's the great thing. He not only was similar to us and distinctly different from us, but he was willing to come and exchange, exchange our payment and to place it on him. To take our place, to be our sacrifice. See, if he had been perfect man, but he hadn't gone to that cross, you and I would still be hopeless and helpless. But he did go to that cross. He was willing to go and to die. He voluntarily, voluntarily laid down his life to be our substitute where we deserve death. And death wasn't just physical death. Death was separation, was separation from God. That's what death really is, eternal death is separation from God. But Jesus says, I will take your place. I will make that exchange. Do you know where that exchange took place? On the cross. It was on the cross where that exchange took place, where he took my place and your place and he became our substitute. You remember those words he said? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That is the point in time where all of the sin of the world, my friend, that's your sin and my sin. 2,000 years ago when he died on that cross, the sin that you committed was upon his life and there he bore the sin of the world and he carried the sin of the world there on that cross and he was separated from his father for a time because of that sin God made him to be sin. And that exchange took place and he took our place. We deserve to be on that cross. I hope anytime you see Jesus on the cross, you're reminded that's where I'm supposed to be. That's what I deserve, but he took my place. He became my substitute. He was willing to make that exchange. Why? Because he loved us. Because he loved us. And because he said, you are my friends. You are my friends. I will take your place. I will be your substitute. I will pay your price. And then I will give to you the free gift of eternal life. I will give to you the greatest gift you'll ever have, a relationship with holy God. I'll forgive you of all your sin, past, present, future sin. I'll fill you with my Holy Spirit. I'll make you a home in heaven. I'll write your name in the land's book of life. I will do all of those things because I took your place. I've done my part. Jesus has done his part. I mean, Jesus was similar to us. He was different from us. And he made the exchange. There's not one thing that God has to do, one more thing that Jesus has to do. It's been finished. It's been paid in full. It's been accomplished. It is there. The substitute has been made. But hold on a second. What about you? What about you? I mean, Jesus has done everything. And he's made available to you and me, every person, every person 
He's made available salvation. He's made available forgiveness. He's made it available. But what about you? Have, have you accepted what he did? Have you accepted that? Grace is God's part. Grace is God saying, I'm sending my son. And Jesus said, I'm coming. And I'm going to die on that cross. And I'm going to pay the price for your sin. And I'm going to mark it paid in full. That's my part. That's grace. We're saved by grace through faith. Faith is our part. Even that's a gift from God. But faith is our part. We're supposed to believe that when Jesus came, he was the son of God. We're supposed to believe that when Jesus died, he took our place. We're supposed to believe that he offers to us forgiveness of sin and if we come to him, we are saved completely, absolutely, and forever. And faith says, I believe he's the son of God and I want him and I accept him as my substitute. God's done everything that he has to do. That's the grace of God. But the question is, have you put your faith in that God? Have you put your faith in that God? For see... In all that Jesus did, he makes it available for every person. But it's only for those who believe. He, he made it available for every person. But the only people who are going to enjoy that rich gift of salvation are those who believe. So have you done your part? Have you believed in Jesus? Have you trusted him? As Lord and Savior, if you ask Him to come into your life, if you accepted His substitution, He wants you to. He wants you to. For see, He voluntarily gave His life to die vicariously for you. So you wouldn't have to pay the price of sin. And if one day you stand before God and you try to give an account of your life, and you make any other excuses about it, it's not the fact you didn't know. For you have heard this day the scripture and truth that has been paid for you. All you have to do is give your heart to Jesus. Just give your heart to Jesus. I pray you will. If you've never done that, you can do that today. No greater privilege I would have than to be able to to pray with you and help you know how to ask Jesus to come into your heart. We had a lady this morning, first service, gave her heart to Christ. What a joy. If you've never given your heart to Jesus, would you come, would you come today? Would you step out and say, I want to know, I want to accept what Jesus has done for me. I know I need him to be my substitute. I, I want that in my life. Would you come and make that commitment today? I hope you will. Don't put it off another day. Today is the best day of salvation there's ever been. What about you, child of God? I hope that you have a, a grateful heart. I, I hope that in this invitation time, we're about to have the minutes that we sit here, I hope you just praise Jesus, thank Him, come to this altar and pray, whatever you need to do, but glorify Jesus in the fact that He did for you what we just talked about by being your substitute. You ought to praise Him. With every ounce of your strength and energy, you ought to praise Him for what He's done for you. Maybe you're looking for a church home and God's spoken to you. He wants you to be a part of Parker family. We welcome you. The invitation time is the most important time we have in our service. It's a time whenever we do what God's Spirit says, not the preacher, what God's Spirit says for us to do and to respond. And I hope that everybody in our hearts, we want to be obedient to what His Spirit would tell us, how His Spirit would lead us in these precious, precious moments. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the Word. I thank you for truth. I thank you for the privilege and opportunity of preaching and sharing your word. And I pray now for that person. Certainly there's one here who's never given their heart to Jesus. That you would speak to their heart. That you would encourage them to have the courage to step out. To come forward to make that commitment to Jesus. To know that their life has settled and their eternal destiny is sure. Because they've given their heart to Jesus. Speak to them now and draw them in this time of invitation. Father, for those of us believers, help us to have a moment together that we just rejoice in your salvation. And thank you, Jesus, for taking our place and for dying on that cross for us. Speak to our hearts and let us worship and adore you in these moments.
For that person who needs a church home, God, speak to them. Help them know that your spirit would be leading and directing and for them to come and to be a part of the Parker family and join us as we seek to serve you and honor you and fulfill your kingdom purpose here in our community and around the world. You speak to that person who needs to come, be a part of our fellowship and, and direct their path. This invitation time is your time. We ask that whatever decisions are made, it will be pleasing and that all of us will be sensitive to say yes to you. Yes to you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, very prayerfully, very quietly, stand to your feet. Our choir is going to sing through a stanza two of invitation. As they sing, we invite you to come to make whatever decision Christ will have you make. The altar is open for you to come and pray. I'm here to greet you, to help you. Our staff's here. You come. As they sing, you come. So much. God bless you. Good to have those who are visiting with us today. And if you're one of our first time guests, please remember to go back to the parlor. We have a special gift for you or either in the welcome area. We have a special gift for you. We'd appreciate you stopping by there. And if you're a second or third time visitor, we're glad you're here and let the minister at the door know you're one of our guests. We just appreciate you being with us. Hope that you would know that we love you and care about you greatly.